Thank you for this ministry. Thank you for your people. Thank you for unto you shall the guardian of your people be. Thank you for your word that is at work in us, causing us to know and to do and to fulfill the will and the purpose of God. Go ahead and thank God for your life. If you are single or you are married, bless him and say, Father, we are grateful to you that your word is coming to us expressly in this season, causing us to conform to the better, even to the image of your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we give you praise. Lord, we are grateful. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you praise. We give you the glory. Thank you, Father. From the rising of the sun to the setting of the same, your name, your name is truly Adonai, Adonai, somebody sing Adonai, stand before your presence tonight, trusting that your word will come to us expressly. Cause our hearts to align with these truths. To the end, that your name is glorified. That our homes are built. And that even the society is affected. In Jesus' name, we pray. Somebody shout a loud Amen. Alright, God bless you all. You may be seated. God bless you. <laughs> Glory to God. We are in part three of our teaching on marriage and family part three glory to god so tonight by the grace of god it's good you can see thank you very much glory to god good to see brother isaac around more grace to you good to see Corey around i love the both of you more grace amen all right so tonight by the grace of god we want to continue our teaching on marriage and family marriage and family so this is part three and as our custom is in the ministry um, for the sake of our media dimension, we try to do well to share the link with our friends online and tell them that you can also join to partake of the feast that the Lord has made available through Equip Community Church. All right, so if you're following online, you can also do that, share with your friends. Tonight, by the grace of God, we want to continue very quickly in part three of marriage and family. And what we are starting with now is people you should not marry. People you should not marry. People that you should not marry. It is interesting that people do not even know that there are people they should not marry. There are young girls and there are ladies that think that any nice man that can kneel down and present a beautiful diamond ring before his friend with flowers and roses and, you know, beautiful scent in a beautiful location ac is blowing he's wearing a good tuxedo suit and he knows now and says will you marry me some ladies think that that is the criteria all right that is the most important thing when it comes to marriage but it's not true there are certain de decisions that we make as a result of our feelings as a result of the situation now a young lady may be pressured by that act to want to say yes, because how would she say no when all their friends are there? Will she not look wicked? Whereas she has not been given time to process. Do you see that? So it's very important to know who you should marry and who you should not marry. Now, singleness is not a plague. Singleness is not a plague. Singleness is not a disease. When you turn to Genesis, the book of creation, when you go to Genesis you would remember in chapter 2 that it was God himself that noticed that Adam was fulfilling purpose, but he was alone. Look at Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. When you begin reading from verse number 15, 15, for the sake of context, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. That means that that man had a relationship with God, God could take him and put him in the Garden of Eden. He was where God wanted him to be in terms of placement. Number three, he was a man that was responsible. He had a job, right? 
he was working. Although he was in Eden, where everything was made ready before man was created yet, God said, even at that, you have to work. So he was working. But here he says, and the Lord God commanded the man, you know, eat of this particular tree, of every tree you can eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, the next thing you will see is that in verse 18, we can read it together now, verse 18 of Genesis chapter 2, let's go. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So you already see here very clearly in scripture that God's design was that Adam could actually fulfill. Now hear me, if you're single here, this would encourage you. You can fulfill purpose without being married. You can please God without being married. And so don't let anybody begin to make you feel less of yourself because all your colleagues are now married and you are single. Singleness is not a plague. Singleness is not a disease. Singleness is not a mark of failure. All your mates are married. You are the only one left. As though being in the wrong marriage is an achievement. Is it an achievement? It is not. And so marriage is also not a rehabilitation center for mad people. Marriage is not a psychiatric hospital. Marriage is a platform for two old people. You know, sometimes we hear this statement in church, your better half. Somebody still used it to me, maybe some weeks ago, and say, how is your better half? And I understand what the person is trying to say. But I cannot, you know, at a conference begin to tell the person, well, I do not really bind to the idea of better half. How about how is your complete partner? Why should it be half? So what they are trying to tell you is that you are not okay with that person. But that's not how it should be. It should be two whole, W-H-O-L-E, two whole people coming together. Now when God removed the ring, all right, from the side of Adam, when he caused a deep sleep to fall upon him, Adam was not less Adam when that happened. Adam was still Adam. Are we together? Someone said, now that they have removed the ring, we are looking for your missing ring. A human being will not be able to exist if the ribs that God made available cannot sustain it. Is that true? So that what we are saying is that, listen, you can do life before even getting married and you are living a great life. Now, marriage should now make it better. That means that at whatever level you are engaging before, when you get married, marriage should amplify your results. Marriage should increase the joy of the Lord that is already at work in your life. It is not marriage that will now bring you happiness. It is not marriage that will now bring you joy. It is not marriage that will now make you fulfilled. Not necessarily so. Marriage should come to add to what is already going on in your life. Are we learning? So, there are people that if you go ahead and stubbornly marry them, or if Christians go ahead and stubbornly marry them, you are marrying them at your own risk. So let's look at those kinds of people for tonight's teaching. Number one, the kinds of people that when you marry, you are marrying them at your own risk. Have you been to the bank recently? And you will notice that uh, small um, instruction. Now what will you say? Cars are parked at owner's risk. Meaning that there's no problem, you can park. But in case you come back and a towing vehicle is already moving your vehicle away to a place where you do not know, is they've already told you. And so that's what I'm trying to do. The Bible says there is a way that seemed right unto a man. It looks correct, it looks great, but the end. So God is concerned about the end before you make the decision in the beginning. So God is concerned about the future of our homes while we are singles. That's why I shake my head when some singles say they don't want to hear teachings about marriage because they are singles. And some married people say, well, I don't need teachings about marriage. I'm already married. Whatever will be, will be. No, listen. Every marriage can be better. Is that true? Every home can be better. Your marriage can be better. My marriage can be better. There is nobody that has the 100% perfection. But listen, if it can be better, why should I ignore it? Are we understanding it? Now look at this. Number one, kinds of people that you, you should not marry. Number one, a proud man or woman. A proud man or woman. If you look at James chapter 4 and verse 6, hi. A proud man or woman. James chapter 4 
and verse 6. This is how God views a proud person. James chapter 4 and verse 6. If you are there, we are together. But he gives more grace. He gives us more grace. That is why the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Some versions will say, he gives more grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. Meaning that, listen, when you are thinking and planning about your marriage, one of the things you want to look for in a man, because a man can have a job, and his job is the source of his pride. There is dignity in labor, meaning any young man or any young lady that has a job and is earning maybe quite some good salary, there is dignity. I'm doing something. I'm contributing to society. I'm solving problems. I'm adding value. And that is nice. But don't, miss, don't let dignity now become pride. What do we mean? A young man gets a job, maybe he's working in, let's just look for something that is juicy in Nigeria. Let's say oil company. And he earns maybe about a million or more than a million every month. Something that some people, some civil servants will earn in three years of active, faithful, committed, devoted service. And he earns it in one month. And he now sees a lady, right? And it can be vice versa. That is actually a good lady doing well, but he just feels there is no contribution that woman really wants to bring to his life, right? Meaning that even while they are friends and she tries to give some constructive feedback, right? Because most times when you are friends, you are not using daddy, mommy, uncle. It's just Isaac Korede, for example. You are not saying, ah, daddy Korede. No, 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 you are friends. Keep the daddy aside. We are about to decide. Are we together here? Yes. You know, except maybe the relationship you had over time or maybe the gap, right? You have been acquainted with certain things about the person. But in normal day, we call ourselves names, right? And then you say, and Isaac looks at Korede, for example, and says, you know what? Marrying you is doing you a favor and passes that message across over and over in subtle ways. You know, there is a way a man can talk to a woman, but the woman gets the message. And there's a way a woman too can respond to a man, and the man is feeling, and the woman is letting him know, listen, you are not the only man. Uh, there are other men. Stop making, don't make yourself feel as if you are not important. How much do you have here? You are earning 50k. Do you know how much? Do you hear the last salary? The fact, she just sends him the message and says, Don't mind those ones, they just pay my salary. Don't mind them. Don't mind them. What do you say? You say you need shelter. I don't worry. I'll see what I can do. Now, that is, those things are little, but they are manifestations of pride. Because when you want to show generosity to somebody that is your friend, and you need to take away the person's dignity, take away the person's self esteem, then it is no more generosity. It is actually a dimension of pride. Even though it is giving, it is not God honoring giving. Are we together here? Now, again, he now says that the reason why you should not even marry the person is not just because of the way the person will treat you. Let's take it further to how God responds to such a man. He says, God resists the proud. Meaning that God has social distance. It was God that started social distance. Are we understanding this? It is God that started social distancing. And he says, God looks at the proud from afar off. But he gives grace to the humble. Let me give you another text. Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 13. Proverbs chapter 8. Are we learning God's word now? All right. Proverbs chapter 8. Because there are all kinds of things that are going on today among singles that needs to be addressed by the word of God. Proverbs chapter 8. All right. Let's look at verse 13. Proverbs 8, 13. See what it says here. To fear the Lord, to fear the Lord, is to hate evil. Thank you. I Now, see what God is saying. God is saying what he hates. Can you imagine that? He says, I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior, and perverse speech. Now, you don't want to marry somebody that is proud. You don't want to marry somebody that is arrogant. One of the signs or indicators that a person is arrogant is unwillingness to be corrected. A proud person hates to be corrected. And so as a young person, I want you to screen yourself by the lens of the word of God tonight. 
A proud person, one of the indicators that a person is proud is what? They hardly receive correction. They let rebuke. He says, he that is often corrected, but stiffs his neck. He says, he shall be destroyed suddenly, and that without remedy. All right? That's what Proverbs chapter 29 verse 1 says. Whoever remains stiff-necked after many rebukes will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. I can assure you, even as a married pastor, that one of the things that I think can frustrate a woman the most in a man's life is when a man does not really seem to her. Remember, this is marriage, right, and family. So I'm talking to both singles, and even married people can learn from it. There are men that never listen to women. So men think that listening to a woman, receiving correction from a woman, it looks demeaning. Do you understand? Like, how can you be correcting me? How can you be talking to me? What do you know? Who are you? Where are you coming from? Who are your ancestors? You know, especially if the man is older than the woman. You hear things like, I came to this world before you. But coming to this world before me, or before her, doesn't make you wiser than her. Sometimes wisdom does not come with age. Sometimes age comes alone. And so it is important that you do not allow arrogance in your life. Number two. Number two. So number one, you do not want to marry a proud man or a proud woman. When people take pride in their gifts, take pride in their privileges, take pride in their opportunities, take pride in the things that look like advantage, and now use it to oppress others, God frowns at it. There is nothing we have that we did not receive. And when you marry a proud man, you are going to be frustrated in your marriage because your input does not count. Even if you, you're almost dying, it doesn't look like anything. Listen, there are three marks of pride, and I'll just give you that as an addition to the first point. Three marks of pride. Number one is what? Hating, rebuke, and correction. Hating, rebuke, and correction. When a man does not like to be corrected, he's a dangerous man. When a woman always gets angry because they corrected her and even keeps mummies, it's a dangerous thing. So number one, sign of pride is what? Hating, rebuke, and correction. Number two, sign of pride is ingratitude. When you are ungrateful, it's a sign that you are proud. How do I mean? Ungrateful people often suffer from entitlement mentality. They feel that you sending them monthly support, you giving them gifts at intervals, they deserve it. Have you met people like that? They feel they deserve it. Yeah, yeah, what are you? Yes, I deserve it. Not necessarily so. Everything people give us, no matter how little it is, we should count it as a privilege. Why? We did not do the work in their hands to give us the money. Paul himself was writing, he says, what do we have that we did not receive? And so the second mark of pride is what? Ingratitude. What is the third mark of pride? The third mark of pride is looking down on others because of something that you consider an advantage. Looking down on others because of something that you consider to be what? An advantage. Looking down on others because of something you say, I, I have this one, I at least may I have this one. They don't. All right? And then let me give you number four so that we enter point number two. Let me give you number four mark of pride. There are others, but just because of the sake of time. Number four, unwillingness to admit wrong and apologize. Unwillingness to admit wrong and apologize when you're wrong is pride because i don't know how you define pride you know most of the time when we think about pride it's always pompous like this but there are things that show that means a man can be doing like this good morning sir good morning man but he's what he's proud a person can even be a pastor and a proud pastor pride has no respect for your title your christian lingo pride is pride and when god sees it it's a signal god does not like it and we must run away from it if we notice it in our own lives as singles or as married people, we must throw it out. Are we learning? If you cannot, you cannot say, I'm sorry, and admit that, ah, I was wrong the way I talked to you. That's why some brothers, let me help you. <laughs> the reason why some sisters will never tell you yes is because 
you have shown that you can never be corrected over and over. They have suggested it, they have said it boldly, they have sent messages, they have given signals, verbal and non-verbal communication. But it's like you're not getting it. It's not that you're not getting it. You don't want to receive it. And so they know that if, if uh, this man, what if we marry and I'll say this one, you will now say, no, you have known me since that I don't used to accept anybody's hair. There are some that even say, even my parents, even my father, they know me. Once I do like this, it's a dangerous thing. All right, number two. The kinds of people that when you marry, you're marrying them at your own risk. Number two, angry people. An angry man or an angry woman. An angry man or an angry woman. Look at Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 17. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 17. An angry man or an angry woman. Now I'm going to explain the dynamics of the things I'm teaching so that it will be more applicable to you. Look at Proverbs 14, 17. If you're there, we read together now. A quick-tempered person does foolish things, and the one who devises evil schemes is hated. Now, we're looking at the first line. A quick-tempered person does foolish things. Now, I hope you know that an angry person, truly, truly, somebody that has a short fuse, can do very foolish things. Now, anger is not a fruit of the Spirit. Anger is not a working of God in a man's life. Anger that now leads to problems and destruction and lack of peace and separations and divorce and all kinds of things is not from God. It's a work of the flesh. It's a work of the anger is a work of the flesh. Are we together? So you notice why we are friends, and that's why you know, even my wife also teaches it that it is important to first be friends. It's common sense. Before you just say, Yeah, oh yes. No. Why? Because if you are not friends and the person is not teachable, you, you have lost the person already. Because now you have, done, you have said, I do. When some things have not been corrected. And you know that sometimes or all the time, it is too late to cry when the head has been cut off. So it's very important. An angry man, an angry woman, while you are being friends with them now, observe, be, be observant. Somebody is angry and goes on WhatsApp and drops 22 powerful angry posts on their status and say listen i've been quiet on this whatsapp but just to let some people know that listen well, i'm talking to you does not mean we are mates i greet you the, and then they will say it in a way that people that are reading will say ah, are you sure it's not everyone said are you having criteria it was just a little bit they say hey i know it will be you the way you said that one <laughs> such men when they are having issues in their home they will go on facebook and do life and say three things you must not do to your husband. The man is wants to talk about his wife. Say three things you must not do to your husband husband as a woman. And when you look at the countenance, you know, because you see, he says there is a way that what is in your heart will always show in your face. It will show. And so he says, three things you must not do to a man. Number one, when a man is talking to you, be easy. Be, and he's pulling his ears, almost cutting his ear, you know. Just call him and say, sir, can you stop your life? Let's, let's stop. Where's mommy? Say, mommy, I don't know where she is. Aha. As men and women of God, and those of us who have ministries, if you want to talk about your home, now it does not mean you must always play the hero and always present yourself as though you are the best man of God or best couples. No. Also talk about your challenges. It helps in discipleship. However, understand that if you are always eager to talk about the weakness, the lapses of your spouse while you are the saint, maybe you are the cause of the lack of health in your marriage. It may not even be your spouse. It may be you that is causing that feedback. Because sometimes when a spouse is behaving contrary to the way they used to behave before, what we think is maybe a spirit entered the person. Maybe it's not so. Not necessarily so. It may be that the person is giving you feedback based on what you are now bringing in. All right? It's like a sounding board. If you clap now, you hear a sound. Don't now be clapping and saying, God, I want silence. You are the one sowing that seed. And then you are reaping the harvest. And you are wondering why it is nagging. You may be the cause of the nagging. Are, are you together now? Because if you are binding the spirit of nagging, but you are doing what makes her nag, the spirit will not leave you. Amen. In fact, the spirit will invite seven more wicked devils in the name of Jesus. Proverbs chapter 14. Please look at verse 29 of that same chapter. Are we getting blessed? I want to keep to time tonight. Proverbs 14, look at verse 29. Whoever is patient 
has great understanding. But one who is quick tempered, displays folly. He's saying the same thing in different ways. Is that correct? Displays folly. There are some people when they are angry, whether male or female, they can be in the mall, ICM in Ikeja, in Lagos, and they, they, they can almost tear themselves in the camera, and then everybody starts blogging, and everybody starts blogging them, and they become popular overnight for acting foolishly. So be careful. Observe them. Somebody is taking these steps on them, and they just say, I will, I will send you to the father's, I will send you to your father's grave. Will, ah! Just little issues. And that's why, you see, if you keep friends with a person for a good time, and that's why marriage counselors will advise you, don't rush it. Now, we are not saying do 35 years of courtship. Nobody needs that, all right? You, you will not get more stars in heaven because of that, all right? But we are saying, take your time. Don't rush it. You know why? Sometimes it takes time to really know a person. Hmm. 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 It takes time. It takes time. And I'm not even just talking of marital, even friendships. There are certain things that will, occasions that have not happened. So you are not able to really say, even in discipleship, some things have not happened. You cannot really say whether this person is a true disciple. He's posting your picture every day after two weeks. I mean, two weeks, one month. But how about two years? Four years? Sometimes it's an opportunity for you to know whether you are even really discipling the person or whether the person true is truly following. Sometimes it may be the lapses of the disciple that makes the disciple truly withdraw. And sometimes it can be the lapses of the disciple. So that's why when discipleship relationship have issues, and that's what I wrote in one of my books, what we typically do is say it must be the disciple that is at fault. Sometimes it's the disciple. Amen. And it's difficult to correct your disciple. Are you following me? Are you learning? That's how it is in some marriages. The man cannot talk to the woman. He must go to the pastor. The pastor will now call the woman and call the two of them. Things that you can settle at all because of anger. You know that once you say it, all of that day, there will never be happiness. So the woman keeps bottling everything in. But till when? And later at the end, they will say the woman has a baby. The woman has this one. Some of those things are actually a product of starvation. Of companionship. Do you know that if you are in a place and nobody listens to you, nobody cares about you, after a while, you start withering. It's natural. Number three. So number one, a proud man or woman. Number two, an angry man or woman. Number three, person you should not marry. Number three, an irresponsible man or woman. An irresponsible man or woman. Remember, when we were reading Genesis chapter 2, from verse 15 downwards, we found out that God took Adam, right, and put him in the garden at Eden to tend and to keep. Meaning that God gave him the assignment of cultivation and then to guard like a security, right, to just make sure that things are in order. Why? He's the representative of God, all right, in that dimension. You don't want to marry a man or a woman that shows many signs of being irresponsible. Let me give you the basic ones and then we we'll go to the deeper ones. Let's start with 2 Thessalonians. Are we learning tonight? Thank you. 2 Thessalonians, let's look at chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. All right, we'll start from verse 6. <laughs> Second Thessalonians chapter 6, verse 3. When I was reading this, I, I laughed. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, we start from verse 6. Let's go. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that it? Uh huh. We command you, brothers and sisters, number one, to keep away from every believer. Now, look up. What I want to now give is what signs of irresponsibility. Are you understanding now? Signs of what? irresponsibility now you know that paul has says paul has already told us that it is beautiful when we gather together david said oh i was glad when they said to me let us go to the house of the lord right but again it does not stop there the writer of Hebrew says that how beautiful and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity it is like the oil that flows from the head of Aaron to his birds and then down to his skirts is that not beautiful? Yet, even though the Bible emphasizes oneness and unity, he's now saying here, Paul the Apostle, writing to brethren as Thessalonica, is telling them, separate from some people. That 
<laughs> it's not one way. Are you understanding? Unity is important, but not unity at the expense of certain things. Because some will say if the person is a Christian, it's good to go. No, it can be a Christian, but an irresponsible. Are you here? An irresponsible Christian. Oh, yes. Let's find out. Second Thessalonians chapter 3. Oh, yeah. Look at verse 6 now. Let's start. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, to number one, keep away from every believer who is number one. I do. I do. I know uh, that, that's the challenge. When you're using King James and you do not use other translations, you may use some words and you don't even know what you're like. Well, we thank God. I think he's just saying no. For example, we say loathsome. We say loathsome. Maybe, maybe the person likes loaf of bread. He likes eating. But it's not so. Here he says what I do. When we were growing up, they used to say an idle hand is the devil's workshop. And that's true to an extent because if you're not doing something, something you do. And then we take it further and say an idle mind. Meaning that when your mind is allowed to wander because you're not thinking productively, you do not have goals that you have set, there, there, is, there is nothing concerning excellence that you are trying to pursue. There is no vision per se. You're just there. When you wake up in the morning, uh, we are, uh, well, we don't even know where we are. We are just alive. And then we complain about Nigeria, complain about neighbors, complain about family, complain about everybody. Then we sleep again. Tomorrow morning, say, ah, all this Nigeria, neighbors, family, brethren. Listen, if you keep living like that and they produce the book out of your world, nobody, even you, will not buy it. Why? There's no quality thoughts. Never marry a foolish. Okay, we'll get there. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Idleness. Don't, so when you have friends with people or somebody is trying to propose to you as a lady, don't quickly go there and say, oh, how I love that brother. Look at the way he sings. He can be a nice singer, but an I do nice singer. I do this is a demonic thing. It's not, it's not helpful. Now remember, so that to balance it, when I was teaching on spiritual disciplines, all right, I taught on the discipline of simplicity. I taught on the discipline of solitude. Now in solitude, sometimes you're actually not doing anything. You're resting, you're quiet, it's okay sometimes to do nothing, but not in this context. I do this here is that you are not doing anything worthwhile with your life. You are not making any spiritual progress. Your, your hands are empty. And remember, the Bible tells us clearly that whatsoever, all right, your hand find that to water to do. It says, do that with the whole of your heart. Do it as unto the Lord. So irresponsibility, number one, I do this. Number two, Let's look at another word. Look at your King James. What is the next word? In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. After, keep away from every believer. Who is number one? What? KJV. Huh? Disorderly. That's another sign of an irresponsible person. Disorderly. That's a sign of an irresponsible young man or woman. Disorderly. And what does that mean? When a person is disorderly, it means that there is no pattern per se to their lives. There is no direction per se. And then in behavior, they are disorderly. They are cantankerous. They are troublesome. They foment trouble at the slightest provocation. They are bellicose. They are cruel. They are disorganized. If you're a sister here, you know, one of my classmates met me some time ago and said, Oh, I heard that you're a pastor, and that's great. When you were in school, you were an SC. I said, Really? I thought I was a cool guy. He said, Oh, you were an SC. Look at your trousers then now. See how wide they were. You could cast them as nets into the sea and they'll get some fishes. You know, I just laugh. We're just playing, right? Don't say, I don't take it to offense as offense. Amen. <laughs> we're just playing. Now says, ah, but your church now, are your members SU? I said, well, we are committed to Jesus, but if it is SU in the terms of being unkempt, all right, not unkept, unkempt, all right, that's the word. So our members are not unkempt. The person said, show me picture. So I went to pick our pictures and I said, and I said oh, really? Yeah, they are wearing earrings. Ah, see, how, see how they are glowing, see how they are well dressed. I said, yes. I'm not pastoring, uh, no. God didn't send me. If God sent me, but He did not send me. Do you understand? <laughs> because uh, remember when you study Revelation, when you get to heaven, I don't think you will see. <laughs> I don't think you will find your eye. Well, anyway, amen. Because the descriptions we saw, we didn't, eh? 
We didn't see some. Uh, we didn't see. We saw responsible. Are you here? If I want you look at the street, look at the stones, look at the new Jerusalem. If when you see the beauty, the arrangement, the the, the raiment, you know. Ah, okay. Uh -huh. Even God savvy. Amen. God savvy. So, a lady, if you are in this ministry and you are following, you are the ones. It's my own people God sent me to amen. So, in case, so that there's no dragging anywhere. If you do not make your hair, that's a sign of a disorderly life. Yes. That means there's no pattern to your life. One week, two weeks, three weeks, one month, six months. You say, you know, you have to tick. You know, then you say, what you want tick? What you want poop? You know, meaning it has, it has gears. It is it's like if something is decomposing. You know, sometimes something is moving. Is, is it an arrow? It's not an arrow. Go and wash it. Amen. If you say that you don't use shampoo in your own skin, use I I I uh, use soap, <laughs> but wash it. Don't open your. Don't mistakenly let your scalp fall. And what pushes out can make a man faint. I say the man just receives a vision that is no more. God said he is not you. Dandruff. Some people's nails. You don't need to have 50,000 for pedicure and manicure, but wash wash your hand first. Wash your nails. Some people's nails, the black, you know those sides. The black, you are asking, sorry, do you walk around a mechanic shop? Do you sell brake oil, gear oil, or engine oil? The person says, no, I don't say, do you work in charcoal company? He says, no. So why is it black? Say, ah, that's how I'm giving up. I that's how it was out. It's not how you are. It's you that allowed it to be like that. James. Some people do not brush their teeth except they need to go out of the house. One day, you've not gone out of the house. Meaning if you don't go out of your house for four days, Meaning the bacteria in your mouth will be competing with the bacteria in the mouth of dogs. That's a horrible thing. Are we together? Disorderly. We enter your room as an undergraduate. Let me talk to undergraduates. We enter your room as a single sister. The things where, you know, I gave an illustration sometimes ago, and it's because of what I saw. You know, how that toothbrush inside pot. Then when you find bathing sponge at the back of the door, entrance door, you are not organized. Your books scattered everywhere. No. Listen, the more orderly your space is, the more productive you are likely going to be in life. Go and check it. Now, there are times if you are a writer like me, let me speak for writers, or you're a researcher, there are certain times when you're studying hard, you don't really have time. You're throwing books around, reading different books, and you're just placing them anyhow. I understand that. But that is not the order of the day. Not that we have never visited it before and found neatness. Cleanliness is part of the science that you understand holiness. Because in heaven, what we see is purity and cleanliness. Are you understanding? Now? Don't marry an irresponsible person. Let's continue now in that Second Thessalonians chapter three. And then he says, "I do and disruptive, and does not live according to the teaching you received from us." Number three sign of an irresponsible person, and you must avoid such people and do not consider them for marriage, except the change is when they always cause trouble in church and in the organizations where they join or belong to. If they are members of a church, that church is either the church break or they, they break away with people. If they are members of an organization, it's either the organization collapses or they they still they must trouble follows them like perfume. I'm telling you, it's a dangerous thing. Disorderly, disruptive. That thing. When you start it, especially if you're young in secondary school, it does not look bad. After a while, it becomes a habit. But when you are in a place, you are wondering, ah, I've not destroyed some. Ah, ah, for two days, ah, I'm trying, you know, we need to do oh, yeah, let's go and find something to. Yes. If they say, okay, don't, don't put this thing here. That is, you say, uh -huh. GDO, yeah, man. yeah, of course, we will destroy it. So we must be careful. Check your life. 
Are you disruptive? Are you a part of Equip Community Church? And then you are gossiping. Gossiping about everyone. Speaking bad. Slanderer. Rather than edifying, speaking gracious words, like I thought last week. Words that are seasoned with salt and full of grace and encouraging and equipping people. You are joining to criticize. You will not listen to the messages. I have met people that do not listen to a message. I will still criticize the message they have not listened to. There are all kinds of people in this world. Amen. Disruptive. Be careful of disruptive people. And those who are, number four, disobedient people. Those who disobey. Who disobey spiritual authority. Who disobey constituted authority under which they are serving. Whether in church or in their workplace. Or in school. They disobey. Watch out for those people. They can be dangerous. Because when they get married, they will cut away from everything called authority in their lives and then they will mislead their spouse. So number one, a proud man. Number two, an angry man. Is that true? Number three, an irresponsible man. And that was what I was showing you. And that was why the apostle was now saying, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. Meaning that a responsible person is an example to others. Is that true? A responsible husband should be an example to other husbands. Is that correct? A responsible wife should be an example, a model woman. All right? I know people teach a lot about Proverbs 31 woman, and I've done a teaching on it, I think a day or two before we got married. But you see, there is the Proverbs 31 man, and you have to understand the kind of man that can groom such a woman, that, can, that will not be envious that she's making progress. Are you understanding? Yes. And then he says, we were not idle when we were with you. Nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked day and night, laboring and toiling, so that we should not be a burden to any one of you. And I think I should say something about this. We did this, not because we do not have, look at it, the right to such help. Because Paul was speaking in Galatians chapter 6, I think verse 6. He says, if we minister spiritual things to you, is it bad if you receive your carnal things? The liberal is worthy of his wages. That thing is correct. But you see, a minister and a servant of God, and if you're called to the fivefold ministry dimension, this is a big lesson for you. People ask, if I go to full-time ministry, how will I survive? I'm a young person. Uh, will I be calling for seed? Or is it that God will really send help? How are we going to do it? Listen, this is the wisdom. If the Lord himself truly instructs you, that do not do any jobs, all right? Many our jobs work anywhere, just be doing ministry. I will provide for you. Then that will mean that you will groom your faith level to be very strong because if you do not do that, you will go a begging rather than go a fishing. And after a while, everybody you have been called to help will run away from you because you always disturb them with begging and they cannot say no. That's the first dimension. Be sure that God truly told you. Now, number two, if you are not really sure about full-time ministry, this is the wise thing to do. Take a job or learn a trade. Open a shop. Start a business. Do some investment. And then do it in a way that you can create time flexibility for studies and prayer. Then still do your job. You know why? If you do not do that and your ministry is young, you by yourself will become the parasite that dead that sorry, I want to say that that deadens your ministry. All right, but that word may not be too correct for that sentence. Let's say you are likely going to be the one that buries your ministry and sucks your ministry dry because you are the one taking from the ministry rather than giving to the ministry. I use the quick community church as an example. By the grace of God, my wife and I are major partners in the ministry. Now, you rarely hear me say this. Have I ever said this before? No. But I learned from Bagel what means that sometimes let the people know so that they don't assume that maybe somebody's just sending money and you are just enjoying. No, not at all. We are major givers in this world, my wife and I. Major. We may not be able to talk about what we do, but major. Why? Because we believe in the work and we know that the God of this ministry truly is actually blessing us. You know, and then we get better and bigger. But don't make the mistake. I'm earning, I, as I am, I still break dogs. And if you ask me, am I a full-time minister? It depends on what you mean by full-time. What I mean by full-time is that anytime God needs me, I'm available. 
and I can do the work, and I can trap, and I can get everything done. But if you are there full time, it's no work and laziness. Then I'm not that kind of a full time minister. Even some of our fathers just recently left their jobs. Yes. And so if you will be a full time young minister, you should at least do ten times better than some of us that are trying to be by vocational or tri vocational. Oh yes. In the rain yesterday, I was still I was still on bike trying to sell GSD puppy. You know why? Because we must make the money too. Are you learning? Yeah. So if you don't have the means, don't, don't be sure. If the Lord did not say it, get a job. A job does not receive, re, reduce your spiritual power and spiritual vigor. So I'm saying it's that job. That job is not allowing me to pray. So you cannot pray while you are walking. You say, no, they don't allow us to pray out loud. You must still pray out loud. They don't allow you to sleep at all. Then what if you are living in Lagos? When you close after 7, you get up to 10 and you must resume 6 a.m. How will you do it if you're working on the island? <laughs> Sometimes you get home 1. You know, I've worked in Lagos before. You will get home to 12. Your father will be waiting outside for level to you. Hey, I beg it, not you. I beg. Then I need the money to get. So you must now find a way to build a schedule that accommodates you fulfilling your ministry of course, while still doing your job, which is also an extension of your ministry in the way. Are we blessed though? Mm. Let's continue. So Paul was saying it, which we were working. And then he now says, we gave you this rule, and this is it. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help. And so the other side of balance is children of God. If we are ministering to you, if we are truly blessing you, if we are discipling you, if you are seeing Christ in us, and you can perceive as you mature that it must take some labor to be able to communicate the word of God, the teachings of the word of God at this level and with the meager resources available, then you are with your discernment, alright, then you should now go the extra man to give more why? because the Bible says let them be counted for double honor those who labor among you in word and in doctrine, then it is based on understanding, not just imposing are we learning? But unfortunately, many Christians are not disposed to give in. So it makes the work more difficult. But God knows how to reward the servant. Alright? Are we learning now? Yes. So Paul now says here, we do this, not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. That's what my own version says. It didn't say should not. It says what? Shall not eat. Meaning, if you are trying to eat when you are not working, it says they should, they should flog your hand and then pass it somewhere. Or go and get work after working and sweating. They pay you. Now you go and eat. Some people will go and visit people. They will be dictating what they want to eat. I said, is that grandfather that didn't? Are you following me here? Say, um, can I have um, uh, uh, basmati rice? Basmati rice? In this, you went to basmati in <laughs> It's not only basmati, it's badminton rice. You will have it. <laughs> anyway, we hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. They are not busy, they are busy bodies. If you are not busy, you will be a busy body. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the food that they eat. And as for you, brothers and sisters, never tire of doing what is good. Are we learning? Number four, quickly. Number four. Number four. Another kind of person you should not marry is a baby an immature man or woman an immature man or woman now there are aspects to maturity there are aspects to maturity and immaturity now there is there is the emotional side of immaturity when a person cannot control their temper they are emotionally immature. They cannot control. They cannot regulate. A baby cannot, most babies cannot control their temper. Is that true? Once the baby is hungry, the baby does not care whether she is in church. 
If it's time to shout and say, ah, yeah, yeah, you start shouting. People say, you know, in church, the baby does not understand, do not disturb. Why? She is a baby. Don't marry a man that, or a woman that does not think before they act. They just do things brashly. A baby believes that anything that touches his or her hand is his own. A baby believes that anything that touches his or her hand must enter their mouth. If you take it from them, you have become their enemies. <laughs> Why? They are babies. A baby does not expect to walk, but a baby expects to play and still enjoy what people that are walking. A baby. A baby does not mind watching cartoon, but a baby minds if you don't feed them at the right time. You say I'm watching cartoon, but don't you know that this is time to eat? Oh yeah, let's start it. <laughs> Why? A baby. A baby does not think of process. A baby thinks of end product, finished product. A baby does not want to think, how, how did you get to this level? Let's hear your story. Talk about your process, your growth. What happened? A baby does want to know, okay, ah, um, ah, you are figure eight. Ah, I, I love that. Wow. Oh, eh. <laughs> A baby. Unfortunately, there are many men in suit, in shirt, in dream, but they are babies. First Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11. Let's see immature people quickly. First Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11. First Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11. When I was a child, I the first thing is I talked like a child. Meaning that when you want to study, all right, to discern an immature lady, an immature man, look at their conversations. Is that true? Look at the things you talk about with them in chat. It is always cruise. Look at their WhatsApp status. From their WhatsApp status, you can tell whether they have junk in their minds or treasures. WhatsApp status one out of eight WhatsApp status in one day, or let's say nine. WhatsApp status one. One man that all the teeth has removed, but two big ones like hippopotamus. And then how to trek from Lagos to South Africa in two seconds. That's the book I'm reading now. That's status one on a Monday morning. Status two. Ah, this life is so tired. What a, why are people this wicked? Eh? Nobody. Status three. Please, anybody that can give me 200 megabytes, my data I want to finish. Status four. All these pastors say, are there true pastors in this world again? Status 5, dear young lady, I call in peace to advise you. I'm not shaking table. As a pastor, do you want to hear the truth from me? There are people that are on mute on my WhatsApp. You know why? There's no... Do you understand? There's no... Do you understand? I said there's no... Do you understand? Eh, so I know that if, if I keep seeing your junk, after a while... It begins to sit in, and me, I'm careful. I don't want. <laughs> I know where I'm, I'm going somewhere. Don't bring your job into my, on a Monday morning. And I say, hey, no, please. Maybe another day, but not today. So if I've seen it one week, two weeks, ah, I just meet the person. We, I trust God for them. I love you, but because some people are not close to you, but they are seeing their status every day. They are already like your friends, and they are speaking into you. Are you still here? I talk. So look at the way they talk to you. I mean physically. Look at the way they communicate. Do they communicate with dexterity, with sense, with vision, with carefulness, thinking before they speak? Or they just say rubbish. They can just see you and say, Whoa! Airport of and all this. They can meet you at the airport and say, ah, What is this? At least you know, you, sh you should behave in the, if you're in somewhere, you should be careful. Some of them can even be in an airplane and just say, baby, I mean, like you. That's a movie we want you. Did you, did they approve this? How did you get this visa? We are not. <laughs> all right. Number one, I talk like a child. Let's look at number two, sign, all right, of immaturity here. Where are we now? First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. Is that true? Yes, thank you. Quickly now, let's go. Number two, I thought like a child. So that means, do you know what that means? What they have been exposed to over time and they have pondered on has become their basis for reasoning, their understanding. 
and then is what makes them think the way they think and then talk the way they talk so it means that babies don't think before they talk actually they talk they behave then they now think hey, hey. <laughs> do you see that so it's very important then I reason like a child. But Paul now said, when I became a man. So you are looking at the way they talk, the way they think, the way they reason. But Paul now said, when I became a man, I put the ways of childhood. Do you know what that means? That's one of the reasons you should not marry an immature person. Now that we are all growing up, there should be some things we are not even talking about again. There should be some things we should not be arguing about again. You are 24. And you are disturbing everybody to give you money that you want to buy canvas at 24. The people you are asking for money at 24, what will they do? Who gave them? Are you here? Some of you are 24, you are behaving like a you are still saying baby of the house at 24. Never say that again. You are not baby of the house anything. By now, you should be not, some of you. Amen. Don't come and use baby easy. That idea, have you noticed that most, I've done my research and I found that most last bonds do not do well if they don't take care. If they don't take care, most last bonds don't do well. The reason why most first bonds don't do well, I understand we have over spiritualized that one. And we say you know, the first bond worth it, and I understand truly. But hear me, one of the reasons why most first bonds don't do well is that they mature too quickly and they miss many processes. And they have become providers, whereas they think that the only thing that shows that you are a healthy young person is that you are already providing and sorting your parents' bills. Why should you at 22 be already sorting your parents' bills? No. The plan is you first grow. And are you understanding? No. Ah. And somebody is 24 and it's not, it's, you are still looking for who to sort your, uh, uh, I want to buy restaurant. Uh, no, people don't like me. Ah. People don't like you. <laughs> okay, amen. amen. If I say this one, it's not me. So I don't want to talk like a child, amen. First Corinthians chapter 14, look at verse 20. Same chapter, look at verse 20 quickly. We're almost wrapping up. We're in good time, amen. Are we blessed already? I'll finish it up on Sunday. If I don't finish it up on Sunday, I can't even finish it up on Sunday. But whatever I stop on Sunday should be good. Uh, you'll find the rest in one of my writings. Now let's continue. Look at verse 20 now. What, verse 20. One, two, go. Brothers and sisters, stop thinking like children. How can you say there are many ways people think like children? Do you know if there is a way I can preach now, or let's say even as I've been preaching, some of you can be here and just look and say, He's talking about me, and I will not come next week because he's talking about me. Who told you he's thinking he has not even thought about you in one year? He's not <laughs> Like you are not even in the radar. He's thinking, you are thinking there. Are you here? He's thinking high. You are thinking low. And he says he's thinking about you. Like you are so important that you should be thinking about you. So people get angry and have a bad day because somebody posted on their status whereas the person is fighting another person. They, they now carry, they will now carry another person wahala and put it on their head and say, he's talking about me. And then they will say, I will, I will, I will revenge. Then they will now post and say, for those of you that are saying, you are being childish. You did something wrong rather than admit that you are now forming. You know that thing that I'm not going to, we are not going to preach, we are not going to talk. You are not doing that person, you are doing yourself. Why? Because when blessing ought to reach you, that state of mind can repel the angelic assistance. Are you learning something here? Don't think like children. Let's continue. Look at it. In our says, in regard to evil. Be infants, but in your thinking, be adults. In malice, be like children, but in understanding, be men. What does it mean in malice? Be like children. Truly, if you are having issues with people, you know what children do. Once they fight, they will come and tell themselves. And then, and then, and then right there, they say, "Yeah, yeah, very messy." But say, "Yeah, yeah," and they will start playing. They can even start eating together. But you know you, that you are now mature. If you are fighting somebody, now bring you food. Ah, toilet. <laughs> Why? They want to. They want to poison me. You think I will die of poison? I cannot die. Whereas, in malice, be children. That does not mean be stupid and say, well, since we are children, let it <laughs> You to have sense of women. However, in malice, be children. Let it go. Forget about it. 
but in understanding, be man. You know, the Bible says that he that wandereth out of the path of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. All right, number five. Are we blessed? Number five. Another person you must be careful not to marry. A covetous man or woman. Hmm. One of the things that covetousness does is that it makes you magnify things more than your value for people. So you will value things more than people. You will value what you can gain more than the relationship. It's all about transaction for you. Give and take. So if you are a young person looking for somebody to mentor or disciple you, and then you hear of one personality, and then you ask three, three questions for anybody that you will disciple me. You are the one screaming. And then you say, number one, does he have a car? Number two, if he has a car, what type of car? Number three, if he has a car and he uses this type of car, how many followers does he have on Instagram? Then they say, well, okay, he doesn't have a car, so there's no type. And then yeah, he just has like 5,000 followers or 4,000 followers. Ah, nah, 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 he cannot disciple me. Because even me, I have 10,000 followers. You know, even me, God has helped me. <laughs> There are many wise people in Nigeria today that are not on LinkedIn, they are not on WhatsApp, but there are some things when they tell you, your life will just change. Yeah. Eh. Hmm. So covetousness, Luke 12, 15. Take heed. Avoid covetousness. Beware of greed. For a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he has. Luke chapter 12 are you there now look at it look at it luke chapter 12 uh-huh and verse 15 do you see that then he said to them watch out be on your guard against all kinds someone say all kinds all kinds of greed life does not consist in an abundance of possessions some people are making the wrong marital choices because of covetousness See, uh, if, if you want to marry me, you, if you, you remember that song we sang when we were growing up, Mr. Macaroni riding on the bicycle. My wife likes this song, she's shaking her head. If you want to marry me, Mr. Macaroni, bum bum, te -te -te -ya, bum uh -huh. now that's a song for babies. <laughs> when you grow up, don't say, if you want to marry me, you must live in Lekki. And your house in Lekki must be in certain areas in Lekki, not just Lekki. And if you be in Abuja, there are some Gauki, Asokoro. You see, there are certain parts even of that place. And if you are in an estate, there are wings in the estate you can live. Are you a serial killer? <laughs> are you a scammer? So all you are about is the quality of the man's pocket, not the quality of the man's thoughts. What you do not know is that the more you learn, the better chances you are that you will earn. So you are looking for quality thinking first, not quality pocket. Does it mean that you should not go and marry a good thinking poor man? Because the Bible says a man can be wise and poor. It's in the Bible. That a rich man and a poor man that was wise met. And the community listened to the rich man and ignored the wise poor man. However, covetousness will make you make decisions because of what you can get. You are not looking at God or what he wants. And so a young man just comes and says, you know what, I'm planning to travel out and I'm traveling out in three months, all right? Now I'm going to propose to you, we're going to get married, then you're going to come over. And you know, ladies, what they you you, you you come over, you know, you relocate. Ah, it's like, Kai, this is it. Ah, in my family, nobody has traveled. Oh! And that is nice. But what if you relocate out of the will of God for your life? If you really have a walk with God, you already know that there, is, there are times and there are seasons. When you check and you notice that it's as though this is not God and there is no peace, you ask your mentors and they say, maybe you should take some time. And then the young man now threatens you that if you cannot make your decision in two weeks, there are ladies lined up. It's just, I'm just seeing what we can do. But it's like you are not serious. 
Dès qu'il t'a fait ça, donc, il OK, OK. See, pastor, see, he was pressuring me. I should have told him yes. Let's see how it goes. And if it does not work, you are here. <laughs> There's a pastor, but helping me pray. Which prayer I give? You have decided. Amen. Covetousness. Matthew 6, 24. I'll give you one more point and then we'll wrap up for tonight. Are we blessed? So Sunday I will see what I can do. Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other. Or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You cannot serve both God and money. You cannot serve both God and money. Some marriages are broken because the, the man likes money. Or the woman likes money. Meaning, if another man or another woman offers better money, they will pack away and say, oh, there's better money it's greener pasture for me. They cannot stay. No staying power. Why? They cannot see be beyond the present. Number six. Number six. Just write this down. Don't marry a lazy person. Remember I already mentioned it. All right? Don't marry a lazy person. So on Sunday, by the grace of God, I'll pick it up from number six. Are we blessed? All right. I'll pick it up from number six. Don't marry a lazy person. Are we blessed? All right. Um, any questions so that we can pray? Any questions? If there are no questions, we can give our offerings as the Lord helps us. Are we blessed? Did you learn something tonight? All right, let's pray. Oh my, do you have a question? Are we good? All right, Father, we are grateful to you and we thank you for your word that has come to us tonight. We receive grace to apply these truths and see greater results in our relationships, friendships, courtship, and even marriage. To so the praise and the glory of your name, we receive wisdom in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. I pray that our marriages will be quality marriages. Our homes will be quality homes. And we will be examples even to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Hallelujah.